All right. So from November 2017, I have seen a total of about 13 films, and that is quite a record for me this month, since I normally don't see the I even half that amount of movies this month. But you know, due to the availability of my schedule on the weekends and some weekdays, I've been able to see you know more movies than you know I could ever imagine. So. I'm going to be talking about some movies I've already reviewed, so again, this is originally going to be on Facebook Live, but this will later be posted to YouTube pre-recorded, so for anyone who's watched my, yeah, again, some of these reviews have been both posted on Facebook and on YouTube, but some of them I have yet to post on YouTube, some I haven't even yet to review until now, so let's start off with Loving Vincent, now this film is going to be one of the many films on this list in which I saw at the Avon Film Center. Now, again, these are films I saw in order of the month, not by ranking. So, Loving Vincent, for those who don't know, this is the first uh, hand-painted animated film, and this is about, you know, the investigation of the death of Vincent Van Gogh, and I found this to be one of the most fascinating films of the year. You know, while the story in parts is a little, you know, dry and slow, the rest of it is absolutely fantastic with the voice acting and the animation and especially the score matching up really well. I mean, I discussed more of this in my review, but I gotta say that, you know, this is a film I did not expect to do this well at the box office. It's still playing in some theaters, so if you're around the area, I highly recommend checking it out. It is truly a spectacle to see on screen. Alright, next is For Ragnarok. I already, again, this is another film I've already reviewed, but yet to be posted to YouTube, so stay tuned, YouTubers, it will be on there soon. But anyhow, so this film, I think it's the best film in the Thor franchise, although that's not saying much, considering that Thor overall is Marvel's weakest property, so yeah, pretty good acting, you know, the CGI is pretty decent, you know, I gotta say it's an overall 8 out of 10 film. Alright, next, next is Wonderstruck. So, next, Wonderstruck, I already did review this film on the same video as Loving Vincent, but again, I thought that was another really fantastic film, a great adaptation from the book by Brian Selznick, who also wrote this film too, and directed by Todd Haynes. This is really just, you know, a very well done film, pretty underrated, I gotta say, overall amongst the critics. I'm surprised this is not getting more love, but I mean, there's a plan for competition this uh, award season. Alright, next film I really do think is brutally underrated compared to Wonderstruck is The Killing of a Sacred Deer, directed by Yorgos Lanfermos, is also co-wrote it. Now, this film I did review on YouTube, and this is, you know, like I said, you know, one of the more fascinating films of the year. Again, the dialogue and the acting is pretty, presented pretty dry, but then again, that's Yorgos' style, so it can be polarizing to new viewers, but to those who have seen films like The Lobster, this is nothing really new, but then again, the way it's handled for the context of this story is just absolutely breathtaking along with the cinematography that just feels so cold, yet, you know, warming at the same time, so highly recommend this one if you get a chance to see it. Alright, next film I did review is The Square. Now, this is the last film I'm going to be talking about that I reviewed. The rest I haven't had time to, well, except for the exception of another film coming up, but The Square... It didn't deserve its palm door. I'm just going to sum it up right there. It really didn't. I mean, you know, sure it was an interesting concept to begin with, but there were just too many subplots, you know, too much going on, not enough resolution. And the resolutions that were supposedly come up with were, you know, pathetic, I think. You know, really good acting overall, and the writing was decent, and it was shot very nicely, but again, you know, it, should have, it was too long for what it was trying to go for. Alright, this next film I did see at the Avon, Law of the Square, Wonderstruck, and Loving Vincent. And this was a special screening, considered one of the best comedies of our generation. It is The Room. Now, I do not need to say much more about this film, because as it is on the internet, everyone who is uh, somewhat of a film fan knows about this movie, and it is being adapted into the new film, The Disasters, which I will review. I do promise about that. But the room, let me just say about the experience, there were spoons, there was a football, and there was quoting. Yeah, it was intense, I have to say that. If you guys want more of a room experience, I will be talking about that during my weekend when I covered the Disaster Artist. Alright, next film I've been waiting to talk about for a while, but I just have not gotten a chance to talk about yet. I saw Lady Bird, directed and written by Greta Gerwig, and starring Cerise Ronan, Lucas Hedges, Timothy Chalamet... Laurie Metcalf, uh, and Tracy Letts, and this film follows the life of, you know, Lady Bird, as, she's, as she likes to call herself, played by Cerise Ronan, who grows up in Sacramento, 
during her senior year of high school. And this pretty much follows her life from the start of the year up to when she goes to college. And this is loosely based off, you know, Greta Gerwig's own life in Sacramento. And I gotta say, it's one of the better films of the year. I mean, the writing is so solid, so realistic. It's like a combination of Mean Girls, if it was with American Pie minus the raunch, in a sense. I don't know, because it feels like so much of a high school film, in a sense. It feels like so much of a personal journal like someone's journal written out in real life. Now, I gave this. Now, I'm giving this movie a 9.5 out of 10. Now, the only reason why I'm not giving it a full-on 10 is because of one scene that happens towards the end of the film. But then, and Timothy Chalamet's performance it was a little iffy. But then again, he was only briefly on him. But yeah, Cerise Ronan easily gives one of the best performances of the year. You know, this she's really proving herself to be. You know, almost. You know. Maybe in a few years, the Meryl Streep of her generation, because she pulls off accents really well, especially in this film. And her performance is really convincing, I gotta say. This is an easy Golden Globe nomination for Best Actress. Uh, hopefully she does get it. Greta Gerwig deserves all the love she's getting right now. All the attention, you know. I may not think this is the best film overall of the year, like number one, but this is certainly something that you guys should not ignore right now. It is from A24, again, proving themselves to be one of the best studios around, and yeah, I would, you know, say more about this movie, but it's heavily dialogue-driven, and the only thing I can really say about it is that the dialogue is amazing. Alright, next is another film I did review for Facebook, and it is Justice League. Uh, I'm not going to explain any more about this film, because I already did it in my review, and I do not want to bring up that experience again, so... Yeah, for if you want a quick score, 3 out of 10. So, yeah, that was garbage. Next. All right, next let's talk about uh, LBJ. Now, this is directed by Rob Reiner and stars Woody Harrelson as Lyndon Baines Johnson, who, you know, was one of our who was one of our former presidents and this follows him from his vice presidency with JFK up to, you know, the middle of like, you know, his presidency in like 1964. Like, yeah, around 1964. And I've got to say about this film, uh, Woody Harrelson does a surprisingly good job as the president. His accent is on point. You know, so is the makeup. I mean, you know, the film overall would be a standard biopic, but Harrelson, you know, and surprisingly enough, Jennifer Jason Leigh both pull off really good performances in this film. Rob Reiner, you know, really isn't, you know, a signature director like Yorgos Lanfermos, but, you know, the, he wasn't trying to be, and... You know, I gotta say, it was not a bad interpretation, so a solid 9 out of 10, because I couldn't really find any complaints with it, so if you're a history buff and, you know, you want to see something that's, you know, really up your alley, then this might be up your alley. Alright, next up, this is one of my favorite films of 2017 so far, it is Free Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri, and to briefly describe this movie, it stars Frances McDormand as, you know, a middle-aged woman who loses her daughter to a murder and rape, and she is trying to report this to the police. The police do not do anything about it. So she puts up free billboards outside her town in Ebbing, Missouri. And it's about what happens between the police and her and the investigation of the murder. And I have to say, this is honestly one of the most heartfelt, one of the most, you know, honest, one of the most, you know, gut, gut punching movies I've seen in a very long time. I mean, it's up there with Crown Heights for sure. But first of all, Martin McDowell, the guy who directed and wrote this movie, you know, does a really ag amazing job capturing, you know, middle America and, you know, the feelings that a lot of people have towards law enforcement and about, you know, crime and about, you know, local attention, about, you know, publicity. Because, you know, this film is mostly a drama, although it has a lot of comedic elements in there, but it's not, you know, a kind of, you know, slip on a banana peel or free stooges kind of comedy. No, it's very, you know, dark. If, you had, if you've seen Seven Psychopaths, Martin McDowell's previous film, you'll get a lot of the humor that he uses in it. Uh, Sam Rockwell, Woody Harrelson, and Peter Dinklage also put off really good performances, too, along with a surprisingly decent performance from Lucas Hedges. Oh, yeah, this film is shot beautifully. You know, the language that's used throughout this film, in addition to the writing, you know, it may feel crass at times, but it feels so natural with the whole environment of it. I mean, it doesn't feel like it's overplayed or overdone. Like, everything in Free Billboards is so believable. I could imagine this as, like, you know, a story that actually happens. Despite the fact that this film was shot in North Carolina and not even in Missouri, so... Yeah, this is a solid 10 for sure. I mean, you know, 
I would definitely recommend this highly. I mean, if, you, if there was one movie from this video that I would that I would ha say, if, sorry guys, I'm just out of loss for words. You know, it's been a long day for sure, been a long month for sure. But anyhow, if, if I had to pick one movie to see this month out of all these movies, it would definitely be Free Billboard. So yeah, go check it out. Just don't bring the kids with you because this is not, you know, a family-friendly kind of a movie. So next I went to go see Murder on the Orient Express, directed and starring by Kenneth Branagh. And this is based off the Agatha Christie book of the same name. And this follows a story about, you know, these passengers who are on a train and then someone gets murdered and they have to try to figure out who did it. Now I really enjoyed this film because it was very classy, very well acted. Very professional, I gotta say. Kevin Branagh pulls off the actor-director shtick very well. Now, I had a couple complaints with the CGI and, you know, one moment that seemed a little overacted and some nitpicks here and there, but other than that, you know, I found this to be a really enjoyable, really entertaining film. I honestly didn't know where the story was going to go at points, so, yeah, if, if you want something to bring the whole family to, like a good little mystery, if... Other movies are too busy, you know, go check out Murder on the Orient Express for sure. Alright, next I went to go see Coco from the director of Up. And this film is about, you know, a young, a young boy in Mexico who is celebrating Day of the Dead. And he's trying to figure out his past family heritage. So then he ends up in the land of the dead trying to figure out his whole family situation. And trying to get back in time before the holiday ends. And I have to say that this film... While it is predictable at points, and while the story can feel a bit cliched, sometimes to the point of emotional manipulation, the way it's done at points, however, is just so heartwarming and almost brought tears to my eyes, because this film is, I gotta say, magical. I mean, you know, when I mean emotional manipulation, I mean it in the absolute best way possible. I mean, you know, sure, you've seen these techniques used in other Pixar films, but the way it's done in Coco, it just feels like, you know, it's unique in a sense, like it belongs to this film itself. Now, I also have to say that the animation and the voice acting is absolutely spectacular. You know, Pixar is professionals with handling this kind of technology at this point. And also, the music for Coco really does feel, you know, I guess, again, I hate to use this word again, but unique. It feels like it belongs in this environment. Like, no one seems like they're acting, no one seems like it's fake. Now, just a little side note here. The short that plays before Coco absolutely sucked. Olaf's Frozen Adventure. Yeah, my friends and I nearly walked out of it. It was that bad. But anyhow, yeah, with Coco, definitely a 10 out of 10 for this one. I mean, I was considering maybe giving it a 9, but the ending really just, you know, did it for me, I have to say. Alright, now the final film of this uh, November series that I went to go see, actually today I went to go see, was Rowan J. Israel Esquire, written and directed by Dan Gilroy and starring Denzel Washington. And this follows the story of, you know, a lawyer who is in Los Angeles who after his, you know, boss dies, he has to try to find work. And about his experience uh, with that along with trying to, you know, solve a case that involves, you know, a, a ransom, you know, kind of bribe thing. Well, not even rant, but a reward. Now, I gotta say, the best part of this movie was Denzel, because, you know, he really carried his performance to the top. I mean, you know, he was also one of the producers, so, you know, he ha kind of had to do well. And the writing for him, you know, just felt exceptional in, this, in a sense. Like, this, he was Roman J. Israel, in a sense, in every way. But the rest of the characters, including Colin Farrell, surprisingly, felt kind of hollow. They felt like they were just there just to fill up space. Some of their reactions felt a little underwhelming, you know. I didn't really get a sense of who they were. And, you know, and also, the plot in this movie kind of clumps up in, like, the first half of the film. It gets better in the second half, but even so, it's still a bit confusing. And, you know, the ending felt a little bit generic. But I really do have to say, this movie is shot amazingly well, and that the music, you know, really does fit with, you know, the whole personality of Roman J. Israel. Yeah, especially the best part of this movie is like the whole beat. There's a, there's this beach scene that happens in the movie when Roman when Roman goes off to like get a little break, and I think that's my favorite scene in the movie because it's shoot it's shot incredibly well. The music, you know, fits the tone of the scene, and uh, you know Denzel, you know, pulls off a really good performance. But the rest of Roman J. Israel Esquire, I just don't think it knows what it wants to be in a sense. It doesn't want to be a crime thriller. Doesn't want to be a courtroom drama. I mean, you know. It's, 
try to juggle so many identities, but it doesn't really try to pick one. Kind of the same problem I have this square, so I have to give this one a 6 out of 10. So, thanks for everyone for watching this whole series. You know, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. If you're on YouTube, if you're on Facebook, make sure to give this video a like and a comment. Also, share this if you feel like, you know, you want to spread the word in my reviews. And I will be seeing the Disaster Artist next week. Now, I know it's coming out in New York this weekend, but, you know, due to some plan, due to planning issues, I will be seeing it on the 8th, but then again, it'll be closer to my local area, so, yeah, let me know if you want me to review any movies and theaters in the comments down below. So, tell again, this is uh, Ian signing off, and I'll see you people around. Bye.